Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to On the Mic with Mike, the premier business radio program around. I'm your host, Mike King. Appreciate you being here with me. We are uh, a social enterprise business program. We are out talking to the game changers in the community. We showcase RVA in a different way. The sounds you're listening to are coming to you from the Common House, 303 West Broad Street. This is the coolest social Social Club co-working space in the city. It's a great place to connect and do business. I'd like to thank our show sponsors, Tom Children, the credit card guy. If you do credit card merchant services, Tom Children is the man. He can help you. Uh, Andy Taylor and Junk Luggers. If you have things around the house that you need removed, uh, hot tubs, bikes, uh, anything like that, rooms to entire household, Andy Taylor and Junk Luggers can help you. Uh, if you have people around the house that you need removed, don't call him. Stop giving gas money, stop cooking, uh, change internet password. Maybe that might help you leave, but don't call Andy Taylor because he can't help you with that, as well as Mama Michelle's Cafe, Best Cafe Southside. Uh, you can follow me on social platforms, hashtag Mike King Biz, hashtag on the mic with Mike. I'm just a humble talk show host out here trying to make a difference. And I see this lady doing something really cool. So I hit her up and say, hey, my name is Mike King. Would you like to come on the show? And I know she said, who's Mike King? So we have Elva Belches is here with us. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you for All right, having me. So I got the name. I got it right, correct? That's right. Full uh, name, Elva Trees Belches. Elva Trees Belches. You are an educator. You're an author. You are doing something really cool. So let our listeners know who you are, what you do. Then we're going to talk about the impact. Because when you come on a program, you have to speak for all the educators who are out there. Like I asked you. How do we find the next generation of people who are going to educate our kids? And it's a tough environment now. I mean, it's never been great for never been great for teachers. Now you guys are social workers, nutritionists, uh, mask wearers, all those things. But that's down the road. Tell us who you are, and uh, let me let me take a look at your book while you while you're telling us. All right. Uh, first of all, um, being an educator is my calling. So that undergirds all that I do. Uh, I'm not currently in the classroom, but, you know. You're an educator at heart. Absolutely. Undergirds all that I do. That is my calling, like my parents before me. I'm a native Richmonder, and uh, I received my BS, uh, I should say, my BA and uh, MA from Hampton University. And As you guys would say, the real HU. Or... Absolutely. But, yes. you know. I understand, and uh, you know, no, no shade to all your other HBCUs, but I went to Lincoln, and we were the first. So I just say you guys should show us some love. Mm -hmm. But uh, I know you guys are always in that thing with other HU and have a little bit of fun with it. Right. But uh, it is the standard of excellence. It, That's right. We there you go. The standard. So look, really quickly before you get to that, let's talk about what that meant. Did, did your parents go to an HBCU? Both parents did, and so. You know, that's a special thing. Uh, out of my four siblings, three out of the four did also. So, you know, HBCUs have a special place in my heart. I grew up just two and a half blocks from Virginia Union. So, you know. It was it, always it, in your world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so whenever I can, I love to uplift and amplify uh, the uh accomplishments of those who have graduated from HBCUs. All right, so when you're at Hampton, yes. what were you going to, what were you studying and what were you going to be? I majored in uh, biology uh, for my BA and MA, and I knew I would go into some aspect of medicine or teaching, and so I did that, and then uh, at the tender age of 24, I actually joined the faculty as a rank and file instructor at Hampton University, and that's that's one of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest professional experiences of my life. And choosing Hampton was one of the greatest choices I made uh, in my life because I had the uh, blessing of having my uh, mentors become my colleagues. And I was able to teach uh, the Bachelor of Science in Nursing majors. I have, I've, I have former students now who are professors in education. Some of them are high risk OBGYNs. Some are, have their doctorates in pharmacy and nursing. So I love, once you're my student, you're always my student. So I want to know what you're doing even 30 years from when I had you last, you see. So and what was the feeling when all of a sudden you're an educator and the light comes on because the student got it? Oh, it's nothing like it. <laughs> and like my parents before me, they were super dedicated. 
I watched them stay up into the wee hours to, to create things so that the, their classes were interesting. And so, you know, they were award-winning teachers. And so I had the, I had the best examples in the world, you see. It is truly a calling. Yes, sir. What my, did dad teach? My father, uh, the late Ernest Parker Sr. taught mathematics. And mm. uh, he taught um, at R.R. Uh, R. Moton when Barbara Johns was there, when the walkout occurred in 51. But he ended up going to Virginia Randolph where he was a revered math teacher from 1955 to 1969. And so, you know, his students have gone on to do incredible things. And my mom was a, a veteran first grade teacher. I used to watch her stay up to three or four in the morning, cutting out stencils and doing anything she could to make, uh, you know, the, the subjects interesting for her first graders. You know, we hear about people talking about no child left behind. That's nothing new. Those teachers during segregation and, and, and past that always knew that their charges had to be twice as good as anyone else in the world. And so I was blessed to see that firsthand. So I carry that with me everywhere I go. You know, I, I try to be the, if, if, uh, if I'm teaching nurses, uh, taught nurses at a few places, I always uh, tell them that first day, strive to be the nurse you would want to have. Because at one point, at some point in your life, you're going to be a patient. I strive to be the teacher I would want to have. You know, I, I always, I used to strive to be the pharmacist that I would want to have. And so when you try and treat people whose um, lives you're somewhat in charge of, like family, you know, it's a special thing. And it, to me, it comes with the territory. Okay, so you're 24 at Hampton. Yes, as an instructor. Live, living a life. Because not that long ago, you were there as a student. Yes, so I was 24 years old. I joined the faculty as, and so- That's crazy. Yes, but here's the blessing. Uh, the students uh, believed in me so much that the um, evaluations were so high. They did something that was very unusual. They gave me biology majors. Very few instructors get the major classes and also the Bachelor of Science in Nursing to get to teach anatomy and physics to them. Back then, they had a first pass rate on the nursing boards of 98%, but they entrusted me with those nurses. And so that was God, you see. And so, you know, you stay up to make things interesting. You bring in special stories. And I do the same thing with history. So being an educator still undergirds all that I do. And that's my calling, whether I'm talking about the body or how medications work or history. All right, Mike Elva Belches is here with this on the Mike, Mike the Best Business Radio program around because we're talking business life and everything in between. We're talking, we talk to the game changers. That's what we do. You are one of them, ma'am. So uh, you're going down the road of teaching and it's in the medical field. Right. But where does the bug with the writing that we end up with Black American series, Richmond, Virginia? Yes, so I taught there for three years and I came back home to Richmond and matriculated at the Medical College of Virginia and graduated from the MCV School of Pharmacy. So I started practicing as a full-time hospital pharmacist, but keep in mind, my parents uh, imbued us with a love and interest of history. So I didn't have to wait for someone else to do that. Regardless of our um, majors, you know, they were telling us stories throughout, you see. Um, oftentimes when I speak uh, or conduct presentations, parents always say, why aren't our kids getting that in school? My response is, why aren't you teaching this at home? You can buy books. You don't have to wait on school teachers because they're inundated with things they have to do already. And so having said that, that history appreciation has always been with us, you know, my, my siblings and myself. And so, you know, it was always there. And, uh, you know, my parents talked about enslaved, enslavement and I had one great grandmother who was a medicine woman. So I kind of felt like I was sort of in those footsteps, you know, with the medication and that kind of thing. So cut to the chase, I uh, practiced until, I practiced for seven years full-time as a hospital pharmacist, then went to long-term care where meds are sent out to nursing homes. And the calling, Mike, became so great to tell our lesser known stories, okay? okay? Keep in mind, I hadn't gone to film school, but I knew I needed to uh, back out of pharmacy, albeit temporarily, 
to dive into those things and prepare myself to tell those stories. Now, when you get the calling like that, yes, people can think you're certifiable because yes. no one knows the calling, but you, God didn't mean for anybody else to hear that calling, you see. And so I resigned my full-time position July the 11th, 1999. And I said, you know, took out a little loan. I said, this doesn't work out. You know, I can always return somewhere, at least on a part-time basis. But the calling became so great to tell those lesser known stories. And by 2000, I was uh, serving as an associate producer and archival researcher for the American Legacy Television Special being produced by New Millennium Studios and Tim and Daphne Reed. And uh, so keep in mind, you know, going straight from pharmacy. To you don't have a history in this thing. Here's the thing. I, I came up the rough side of the mountain. I gleaned the um, gifts of archival research through genealogical research at first. And then I was able to cross over and I still use both today, you see, and I help other people find their roots. So keep in mind, full-time pharmacist within probably a few months, I was an associate producer on the American Legacy Television Special. And that thing aired uh, in syndication all over the country. Okay, that was 20, 2001. But while working on that and uh, follow up to it, I was using uh, installments of the Black America series. You know, I looked at Norfolk and Atlantis. And I said, you know, let me see if anybody's done the Richmond installment. And they had not. On a Friday, I emailed to say, I want to do that. By Monday, I'd heard it's yours. Okay, so for the folks who are not in, as enlightened as you, tell me about the Black America series. Yes, Black America series is one of the many series uh, of books published by Arcadia Publishing. They've merged with the History Press. And so oftentimes people from those areas who know the area well will take it upon themselves to collect photographs, um, interview people and that kind of thing. And so I realized that here was an opportunity that was really uh, needed. Why? Because when I looked around, I didn't see anything that could be used, Mike, by third graders through visiting scholars alike. And so that's a vehicle. You know, sometimes university press books are hard to read, but I wanted something that a third grader could browse through a visiting scholar alike. And it's been now in print for 20 years. And they've allowed me to update it periodically. And I did so again for new and corrective scholarship, some of which is my own. And so I interviewed people like Oliver Hill and people like uh, Dr. William, William Ferguson Reed and others uh, for that over a course of a few months. And then in 2002, it came out exactly 20 years ago, February or March. And I think it sold about a thousand that first month actually, but it is much needed and, and just how far and what's the impact. Uh, I have to say that I've been blessed to, if you look at where it is located, it is carried by over 40 libraries nationwide and even the United Kingdom. Uh, people, uh, places as prestigious as of course, Hampton University's uh, library, Virginia Union's, uh, the University of Virginia, Princeton University, UNC Chapel Hill, University of Chicago, even places as far as LA. But the beauty of it is that people can come here and they've used this book, even people from Japan have used that book to conduct walking tours. But what I couldn't foresee, Mike, is this. It is now being quoted and cited in master's theses and doctoral dissertations around the country. It's highly unusual for a pictorial book to be cited, but I made sure that the captions were chalked full of information. For sure. Yes. Lot carry. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. And you see, along the way, let's talk about the new scholarship, because what I was seeing is that, and I'm in public history, I should mention that, the difference is with public history, you're distilling history for the common person, like you and I, right? Okay. Not scholar to scholar, so that it's interesting. So I go into elementary schools, and I lecture sometimes nationally next to the biggest people in history. And it's all relative because you've got to know your audience, right? And so having said that, uh, I made sure it covered areas as diverse as before freedom came, the black church. 
And I, I asked people about what should be in there. And for an example, I um, connected with Celia Suggs, who used to head up the Maggie Walker uh, historic sign. And I said, what would you like to see in this book? You know, and she gave me valuable information. And I also talked to Dr. Edgar Toppin, an incredible history professor at Virginia State. Uh, he was at one time head of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And he said, you know what? I'd like to see more about the Black businesses in Richmond. And so you're going to see more in that book than you will in any other book. But keep in mind, it was fortuitous to do that. And I, you know why? Because Jack, Historic Jackson Ward today is the largest national historic landmark district associated with African-American history and culture, according to the Department of the Interior. So you've got a book that's already out there that can share those rare things. May I share some of the, the extraordinary things that yes. can be amplified? Richmond is home to the very first bank chartered by Blacks in all of America. When I'm in, in other states and I ask, uh, the audience, can anybody name the first bank? Invariably, they say Maggie Walker's bank. And they're astounded when I say, well, hers was the fourth Black bank here. Between 1888 and 1929, we had 10 Black-owned banks. Can you believe that? And each had a, at least a branch in Jackson Ward. 10 banks. Number one, the True Reformers Bank. Our, the True Reformers Bank, uh, and the full name for that is the Savings Bank, of the Grand Fountain of the United Order of True Reformers, better known as the True Reformers Bank, received their charter in March of 1888, and they opened April the 3rd, 1889. They, come in, they became the first bank chartered by Blacks in all of America. And I've got rare memorabilia from them. And so you see, uh, before John Mitchell was John Mitchell and Maggie Walker was Maggie Walker, we, the Maggie Walker we know, they were true members of the True Reformers. And so when people on television talk about Tulsa's Greenwood, you know, as a black uh, a capital of entrepreneurism or Durham's little uh, Haiti or Wall Street, Jackson Ward stands as the birthplace of black capitalism. It's nice to say there we're also the um, a birthplace of the Harlem of the South, but I mean, you're talking about some extraordinary things that I didn't get in school and I was born and raised here. Uh, we had uh, between, 1877 and 1929, how many black owned and published newspapers do you think we had in Richmond alone? Three or four, maybe. 10. Okay. The first one was the Virginia Star, founded by O.M. or Opway M. Stewart. There are extant copies at the Library of Virginia, and it's some of the most eloquent writing you will ever see. And so I seek to amplify those stories that bring about a greater uh, awareness and also engenders a greater level of respect, of respect. Because if all we hear about is what was done to our people, but we don't hear about the resilience and how they got over, when we do hear about those things, it serves as a blueprint today, you see. When we look at, because today, what are we looking at? How do you mitigate the effects of healthcare inequality? You know, the things that we talk about, social determinants of health, housing, these things are not new, but there was this profound sense of collectivism, you see. Would you be surprised if I told you that in Jackson Ward alone, there was not one but two hospitals, Black-owned hospitals at the same time in 1903? That's one of my specialties, um, you know, amplifying the roles of uh, early Blacks in medicine, dentistry, and pharmacy. I like to go where there's a dearth and just, you know, blow the uh, cap off of those things so that people will will know a lot more about us. Let me share one more thing about before freedom came. We hear about enslavement mostly, right? In the right. slave trade, but some people still aren't aware of the fact, and that's okay, that you had a free black population here that was mm -hmm. a very um, uh, forward thinking, if you will. In 1860, Petersburg led all cities in Virginia with 3,200 free blacks. Richmond was second with uh, 2,600 free Blacks. Let me share with you one special story about one family. We got to, we got, okay. I, oh, I'm I, sorry. We, we got to get, we got to okay. get on. I got to have you back. Okay. Because this is fascinating. Really? So uh, we're going to, ladies and gentlemen, on the mic with Mike Alva Belchers is here with us. 
the uh, Richmond, Virginia, it's the Black American series. We got to have you back on 30 minutes does you no justice. No, it does not. This is something that's going to take a little bit of time. Sorry about, uh, all right, how can people find you and get the information about your book and what you're doing? Uh, they can, it's Carrie, uh, of course, Barnes and Nobles. I try and send people to the Black History Museum and Cultural Center of Virginia to support their efforts. Uh, but, you know, online, it's there in drugstores, uh, walmart.com, Target. So uh, if you order it, though, from Arcadia, if you order multiple copies, you're able to qualify for discounts. And so it can be used as a fundraiser for, for people's groups, if you will. All righty. Mm -hmm. One of Mike with Mike Elva vouchers. I'd like to thank you for coming in. Uh, as I say, we talked to the game changers out there, and she is definitely it. We're going to set aside uh, something to have a longer format for you to tell your story, because this is very interesting. And we're kicking off Black History Month with this, which is what's well, every month that needs to happen. But uh, we're doing it in style here. So I'd like to thank you for coming in. Uh, on the mic with Mike, uh, the best business radio program around. Thanks now. Thank you for having me.